On October 22, 1989, Jacob Wetterling, 11, his younger brother Trevor, 10, and his best buddy Aaron Larson, also 11, were riding their bikes back from a convenience store in Street Joseph, Minnesota, when a gun-wielding masked man emerged from the woods and ordered the youngsters to lie face down on the ground. Before seizing Jacob and commanding the other youngsters to run without looking back, he questioned each youngster his age. Jacob was last seen alive at this point. How long will it take to solve this case? Hi, and welcome to Crime Case Files. If you are new here, please subscribe so we will create more intriguing content for you. Let's have a look at the 27-year-old cold case, finally solved by a mom. Street Joseph, a quaint little village tucked away in the center of Stearns County, Minnesota, provides a lovely respite from the bustle of metropolitan life. This small town, located about 75 miles northwest of Minneapolis, has a special combination of history, natural beauty, and small-town charms that appeals to both locals and visitors. Here, people interact more naturally and have a higher quality of life, which stresses the value of bonds and shared experiences because of the slower pace of living. Street Joseph becomes a snow-covered wonderland in the dead of winter, providing chances for ice skating, sledding, and other winter sports. During the holiday season, the town's beautiful decorations and welcoming environment create a lovely setting. The enduring spirit of small-town America is reflected in Street Joseph's function as a hamlet in Stearns County. It serves as a reminder that despite the world's rapid speed, there are locations where time seems to stand still and relationships between people and their environment are still strong. Street Joseph, Minnesota stands as a tribute to the ongoing allure of rural living, whether for its historical significance, natural beauty, or close-knit community. In this seemingly perfect tiny village, in October 1989, a terrible crime took place. Before we get there, we have to go back to the beginning. On February 17, 1978, Jacob Wetterling was born to Jerry and Patty Wetterling, who were pleased to have their first child. Minnesota's long prairie, his younger siblings were Carmen, Trevor, and Amy. The family lived in a small town called Street Joseph in the middle of Minnesota. Jacob grew up in a large six-person family, where they all contributed and enjoyed one another's company. Jacob was a fun-loving, active young man who loved animals, music, sports, and other activities. He was funny and sociable, and he participated in basketball and baseball for his school. Jacob worked very hard at school and loved science especially space. Trevor, his younger brother, and he had unrestricted access to their bicycles from their parents. When they rode their bikes across the city, they felt emancipated and liked exploring the great outdoors. Sadly, something tragic happened unexpectedly during one of these rides, as it does to most young people their age. On October 22, 1989, Sunday, the weather in Street Joseph, Minnesota, was tranquil. Everyone in the Wetterling family had the day off, so they all stayed home and relaxed. About 20 miles away in Clearwater, Jerry and Patty got ready for a dinner gathering. Trevor, since he was the oldest, Jacob was responsible for looking after Carmen and Amy while their parents were at the party. Since Patty and her husband hadn't gone out alone in a while, she wanted the kids to stay at home. Approximately nine hours after they left. During the celebration, Jacob called Patty and asked if she would mind taking Trevor and his bicycle to the nearby Tom Thumb to rent a movie. No, she answered. Because it was now dark, they would have to leave their younger sister home alone without someone to watch over them. Although the boys weren't pleased, they didn't immediately give up. They then asked their father, Jerry, if they could make the little trip to the grocery store. They assured him they would use their torches and exercise caution when traveling the mile to the video store. They also told him that their neighbors had been contacted and that their 14-year-old daughter would be watching the girls. While the two boys commuted to the store on their bicycles, Jerry agreed to take them as soon as possible after recognizing the boys' overwhelming wish to leave. Aaron Larson, a friend of Jacob's, was contacted by Trevor and he visited them at their residence to access the video shop. 
The three of them easily located the movie store while riding their bikes. They spent some time exploring the area once they arrived in order to discover the movie they were looking for. They ultimately chose the naked gun on VHS. Because it was dark, and they needed to use their flashlights to see the boys when they were spooked after a little ride, they rented it and then hopped back on their bikes to travel home. A man wearing a mask suddenly appeared from a driveway and blocked their passage. He told them to get off their bikes, and they were astonished when he brandished a gun at them. He made them all lie on their stomachs on the pavement after ordering them to put their bicycles in a ditch next to the road. Then he asked what their combined ages were. Trevor was the youngest. Therefore, he gave the order to slowly stand up and head toward a neighboring woodland when he realized that. He informed him that he would be shot if he made a sound or turned to face him. Trevor was terrified, so he did as the stranger told him. The man in the mask then turned to face the other two boys and ordered them to face him and take their eyes off the road so he could see them. He took a moment to think, then seemed to be focused on Jacob. Then, just as he had told Trevor to do just a moment ago, he told Aaron to get to his feet and make a slow escape. Aaron kept his word, slowly getting to his feet before giving his closest friend Jacob one more look. He turned around and rushed in the direction of the forested area where Trevor had gone. Everything saves his captor. After this, no one else saw Jacob alive. When they returned to Jacob and Trevor's house, no parents were there because dad was watching them. The girls told their neighbor's daughter what had transpired. Because of the way the boys seemed scared, the girls understood they were just playing and assumed something terrible had happened. In response to her call, her father, Merlin Shares, went to the Wetterling residence. He got in touch with Patty and Jerry right away while they were still at the dinner party. Additionally, the police were called, and they showed up quickly. Patty and Jerry hurried back to their house after the dinner party. They were happy to see Trevor safe and well at home, but they were quite upset by what had happened to Jacob. Jacob was soon sought after seriously. The Stearns County Sheriff's Office sent many of its deputies to the road's end, where Jacob was traveling. But that night, at the commencement of the investigation, the police made a crucial mistake that was difficult to fix. Not all of them visited the nearby residences where the youngster was taken that evening. It's typically vital for the police to speak with residents in the kidnapping zone within the first 24 hours of the search in cases involving missing persons, such as Jacob's kidnapping. People are more likely to have witnessed or overheard something unexpected than those who live further away because their recollections will still be current. The police may not have taken the appropriate steps at the time because they were too confident they would find Jacobs quickly. The sheriff's deputies spent much of their time searching for Jacob on foot and from a helicopter rather than visiting with every local in the area where he was kidnapped. Dan Rosier, who lived close to where Jacob was abducted, was the only person they communicated with. Dad told them that Jacob was kidnapped on the same night. A little car had been seen rushing up his driveway making a quick turn, and then turning back the way it had come. The police's initial thoughts were that this car may have kidnapped the boy, and they found evidence in the form of nearby tire tracks. However, owing to his proximity to the crime scene at the time, Rosier was also a suspect. Because of how soon the police arrived, the suspect had little opportunity to escape. On October 23, 1989, Stearns County Sheriff Charlie Graft recalled anticipating that the case would likely be resolved within a few hours. Because it was too dark the first night, the search was put on hold. The next day, officials from ADM went out again to look for Jacob. As the search suggested, FBI agents entered the case to help with both the search and the investigation. On October 24, an FBI profiler joined the investigation. Based on what he knew about the kidnapping and the guy who took Jacob to Street Joseph's church, he thought that the man who abducted Jacob was probably a white loner with a physical defect who had done something similar in the past. On the 25th, more than 500 people showed up to pray for Joseph's safe return. On Thursday, the 26th, 
Business people from Minneapolis and Street Paul offered a $100,000 prize for Jacob's safe return as the story attracted national attention. The National Guard and state police would join the search, the governor of Minnesota's state said on the 27th. They would look for Jacob within a 700-mile radius of Street Joseph. J. Jacob was the focus of one of the most thorough searches ever carried out in the nation. Numerous actions were taken by citizens from all throughout the country to assist the Wetterling family. The case itself generated a great deal of media attention. Thousands of flyers were produced and disseminated via mail, pizza delivery boxes, and storefront windows, and people wore white bands pinned to their shirts as a sign. All across the state of Minnesota, the radio was playing Jacob's favorite song and a message from his mother, Patty. Before the internet, these techniques were employed to communicate information about a missing child. Many of the volunteers who helped with the hunt for the toddler worked for 18 hours. No odor was detectable, not even with sniffer dogs present. On October 29th, at the conclusion of the first week, more than 100 agents and law enforcement personnel from both municipal and federal authorities were actively working the case. It was unfortunate that Jacob was not present. In the past, many people have observed that the police at the time expanded their search too quickly and broadly. Instead of conducting a thorough investigation that was publicized by the national media, they should have focused on a small area immediately surrounding the scene of the kidnapping and made sure to talk with everyone who was there before extending the search. In November 1989, the public could view police sketches on three different days. On the night the girl was abducted, one out of every six men who were seen in the Tom Thumb store, he apparently turned to look at the people. He weighed 200 pounds, was white, and was in his 50s. On November 12, six days later, they gave up and moved on to new insights. What concerned a man who, two weeks after the kidnapping, was overheard discussing it in a Tom Thumb store, one of them allegedly included a man who tried to abduct a young boy in New Brighton, a Minneapolis suburb, on the night the boy was kidnapped. One in every six men who were seen in the Tom Thumb store, they had many ideas as a result of these sketches, but none of them worked. On November 30th, they released what they consider to be the most accurate sketch of the kidnapper. The three previous sketches were blended into one. The composite sketch offered the authorities many potential outcomes, but none of them came to pass. On December 13th, Jared Cheryl, who was kidnapped from the nearby town of Cold Springs in January 1989, met with FBI officials. Jared, who is only 12 years old, was contacted by the detectives to offer his help in sketching a picture of the person who had taken him. Because they thought the same person might be to blame for both of these crimes, Jared helped them produce a picture that garnered a great deal of interest, hundreds of new tips, and raised awareness of the case. On December 16th, Daniel James Henrik, a resident of Plainville, roughly 30 miles from Street Joseph, was interviewed by FBI agents. It's possible that he was a suspect. Jared and Jacob weren't present in any of the recent kidnappings and assaults of young boys that took place in that area. When the FBI contacted Henrik, they learned nothing regarding the instances of Jacob and Jared, which left them baffled and unclear about what to do next. On January 12, 1990, they paid Henrik another visit and had a conversation with him. He gave them his tennis shoes and some body hair this time, so they could compare them to any other evidence they might have. Three days later, on January 15th, Rick permitted the detectives to take the back tires off his blue 1982 Ford Focus hatchback so they could compare them to tire prints found at the scene of Jacob's kidnapping. The following day, on January 14th, the detectives discovered that Henrik also had a 1989 Mercury Topaz, which he had until March of that year. Therefore, if he had carried out his plan, he would have done it in this car. Jared is the taker. On January 24, 2016, police conducted a search of Henrik's residence. During that time, various items were taken, including two police scanners, a carrying case with a list of scanner frequencies, a pair of boots and apparel. On January 26th, Jared had displayed police a photo of Henrik 
and five other white men. Given that he was unable to ascertain which of them had kidnapped Henrik, he only gave Henrik a rating of four on a scale of one to ten. The FBI was informed on February 9, 1990, that a fiber found on Garrett's clothing matched fibers, taken from Henrik's Mercury Tobas, in January 1989. On the same day that Jared was kidnapped and mistreated, Heinrich was caught. However, he asserted his innocence, and it was made public without any charges. Following that, there were fewer leads to follow up on, and as time went on, fewer agents were tasked with looking into Jacob's disappearance. The matter could not be resolved, despite the fact that it involved a missing individual, and the trial was ultimately lost. During the search and investigation, the loss of their son and brother caused the Wetterling family to go through a difficult time and destroyed their hearts. Despite the affection and assistance they were shown by neighbors and people all around the country, as time passed, they started to question whether Jacob would ever come back to them alive. Patty Wetterling, despite her anguish, felt that other families shouldn't have to go through the same pain as hers. On January 16, 1990, Jacob Wetterling Foundation was going to be established by the Wedded Links to help with this. They sought to raise awareness about child snatchers, their tactics, and what each person might do to stop them. Despite the pain the family was going through, they made the most of it by helping others however they could. American laws now apply differently in these types of instances as a result of Jacob's case. The Jacob Wetterling Act was approved by the government in 1994. For the first time in American history, legislation requiring each state to keep a list of those who have been convicted of sexual offenses was passed. This statute has helped numerous other people discover their own lost children throughout the years, establishing a lasting legacy. Many individuals were helped by the wedding links, but they were still in the dark regarding what had happened to their beloved Jacob. They still have hope that he might still be alive even if the likelihood of that has reduced each time. Here is Joy Baker, a mother of two who became interested in Jacob Wetterling in 2010 at the age of 43. Joy was 22 years old when Jacob was kidnapped from Street Joseph in 1989. She was determined to find out what had happened. She then got in her car one day and drove to the place where he had been abducted. Joy did what she did best when she wasn't sure how to start. She published a blog. Additionally, she posted a blog post titled, Where Are You, Jacob?, on October 23, 2010, pleading for the kid who had been missing for 21 years. Unaware that this was only the beginning of a voyage that would run for the following few years of her life and take her to places she could never have dreamed of, she started off on this journey. From that point on, she diligently documented everything on her old school blog, so you can follow her journey. She jumped right into the inquiry, asking questions and following up on every lead. She searched through old news articles and police reports for even the slightest stress. Shortly after that, she realized that the initial inquiry had contained a number of inaccuracies. At the time, law enforcement professionals ignored potential leads, mismanaged or lost important evidence, and even omitted to speak with some vital witnesses. Joy's investigation was so thorough that she wrote an entire blog entry about the moon's phases on the night of the kidnapping. She realized that the witnesses would not have been able to see an automobile that night because the moon wouldn't have been fully visible. This suggested that total darkness would have prevailed during the incident. As Joy looked for information on the long-ago case, she was referred to Jared, who had been a tiny part of the first inquiry and whose case was associated with Jacob's. Cheryl Jared was still pursuing compensation for the terrible incident that had happened to him when he was a youngster, even as an adult in his thirties. Jared and Joy began investigating the matter together. They made a huge discovery after finding a newspaper story with data from 1987. The kidnappings and attacks on young boys that occurred between 1986 and 1987 were the subject of this report. Each of these crimes was also committed by a person hiding his identity and carrying a firearm. Jacob had been transferred to the small town of Painesville, which was just about 30 minutes away from all of them. 
Joy was able to locate some of the victims thanks to Jared's assistance. She found that they were all mature men looking for reasons for the horrific things that had happened to them decades before. Jared likes to combine the sites of each assault. It was dubbed the Painesville Attack Cluster. What they discovered shocked them. They then brought it to the police. This reopened a case that had been closed for several years. As a result of Joy's blog becoming popular and the officers receiving several tips, the subject became a hot topic once more. The incident was brought up once more across the nation. Joy's blog went silent after this as the police looked into what had happened. 26 years after the initial occurrence, in 2015. Finally, the police were once again on the watch. On the clothing Jared was wearing when he was abducted, a foreign DNA sample was found. This was evidence that the person who abducted Jared was not American. On July 10, 2015, they discovered that this DNA profile matched a man who had lived in Painesville for 59 years at the time of the kidnapping. The person's name was Daniel James Henrik. Joy and Jared had also been keeping an eye on Henrik, who had been involved in the initial investigation, but there had never been enough evidence to indict him. Then, on October 27, 2015, last but not least, in front of Judge Jeffrey J. Keyes, a magistrate judge, Special Agent Shane Ball accused Henrik of a felony. Henrik was accused of 25 additional charges, even though the deadline for the Jared case had passed. After being apprehended, his attorney struck a deal so that he would only be charged with the other counts and not with murder or kidnapping when the case was brought before the court. In return, Henrik gave them the location on October 31, 2016, where he had concealed Jacob's remains. The location was on a farm near Painesville, not far from Henrik's current residence and around 30 miles from Street Joseph. Henrik appeared before the court on September 6, 2016, more than 27 years after Jacob Wetterling was taken. He admitted to taking him, abusing him, and killing him on October 22, 1989. Additionally, he admitted that he was the one to steal Jared earlier that year. He explained to the court that while he was traveling down the road, he saw three young men riding their bikes at night with their lights on. He claimed he waited for them to cross a driveway while parked there. When they did, he ordered the other two boys to flee while taking Jacob hostage. He shot him dead and dumped his body in a gravel pit next to a road that goes to a sewage pond after taking Jacob to Painesville, a place he was familiar with. He returned home and waited there for several hours. After midnight, he went back to where he had left Jacob's body and established a position 100 yards to the north of the shooting scene. He found a bobcat that he knew how to operate because it was being used nearby for work. He made Jacob's burial and arrived a minute late. He went back to the tomb a year or two later and discovered that Jacob's red blazer was still on display and that he had been parsley dug out because of his current anxiety. He moved his bones to a property in Painesville and buried as many of them there as he could. When he was caught for his various crimes, he gave the police the same address. Henrik was given a 20-year prison term for his criminal behavior, and he will serve the final 20 years of that term at the Massachusetts Federal Medical Center. With Hendrix's admission and the discovery of Jacob's body, the investigation into one of the worst crimes ever committed in the U.S. came to a close. The Wetterling family received Jacob's body once the investigation was over. They were able to provide him with a dignified funeral in Collegeville, Stearns County, Minnesota, at the Street John's Abbey Friends Cemetery. Joy Baker developed a relationship with the Wetterling family as she worked to help solve the case. She insisted that she didn't assist in the investigation in order to become well-known or receive credit, but rather because she wanted to help another mother who was going through this terrible struggle. Patty Wetterling and Joy Baker developed enduring friendships. In order to communicate their story, they worked together on the book Dear Jacob, A Mother's Journey of Hope. Fatty has become well known for her work to ensure the protection of children and for helping to enact the Federal Wetterling Act which changed how the law was enforced in this kind of situation in the U.S. Even though they are now confident that their beloved Jacob is dead, 
It nevertheless broke their hearts to realize that he had indeed passed away. The Federal Wetterling Act, which was passed in his honor and the Jacob Wetterling Foundation, continued to carry on his legacy. According to Patty Wetterling, Jacob was still alive before we found him. Even so, awful people like Henrik are probably never fully gone. They won't be able to get away with Roe Trosset with ease thanks to the Act and the Foundation. Jacob Wetterling's harrowing story is another. How he was taken away. How his family laboriously looked for him. How their efforts were in vain. And how they finally located him by comforting them. What do you think about our video? Please let us know in the comments area below. If you enjoyed this video and would want to hear from me again, please subscribe and turn on the notification before leaving. Thank you for watching us.